1971. For nine months, war raged in South Asia between the Pakistan army and those in East Pakistan who wanted independence. People died in their hundreds of thousands and millions were displaced. Out of this violent and bloody struggle, Bangladesh was born. More than 40 years have passed, but the scars have not healed. The massacre of Bengali civilians by Pakistani troops and their collaborators is still an open wound. In 2010, Bangladeshi Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina set up the International Crimes Tribunal to investigate and prosecute suspects for war crimes and genocide. The tribunal has already charged more than a dozen people and sentenced several to death, including Delawa Hussein Saidi, the vice president of Jamaat Islami, the largest Islamic party in Bangladesh. The verdicts were welcomed by many who wanted justice for the atrocities committed during the struggle for independence. Hundreds of thousands of students and anti-war protesters gathered in Shabag Square in Dhaka, demanding the execution of all war criminals. But the trials have also caused a backlash among those who see them as politically motivated and an attack on Islam. In February, protesters, led by Jamaati Islami and other activists, took to the streets. In the violence that followed, several people died and hundreds were injured. And the tribunal itself has come under fire from international observers. In the latest indictments, one of Britain's most prominent Muslim leaders has been charged with war crimes. Chowdhury Muinuddin fled to Britain after the 1971 war. Now he's accused of leading a notorious militia during the war, abducting and torturing civilians and helping Pakistani forces to target and kill top intellectuals. The International Crimes Tribunal in Bangladesh has brought 11 charges against him and it's set to try him in his absence. He could face the death penalty. Chowdhury Muinuddin has said little about the charges against him until now, when he talks to Al Jazeera. Chowdhury Muinuddin, thank you for joining us on Al Jazeera. Um, you have been charged recently by the War Crimes Tribunal in Bangladesh, uh, and an arrest warrant has been issued for you. You are accused by the tribunal of playing a role in the abduction and killing of 18 people during the 1971 war of independence against Pakistan. According to Muhammad Abdul Hanan Khan, the tribunal's chief investigator, uh, they have prima facie evidence that you were involved in a series of killings of intellectuals. What, I wonder, do you make of those charges? Well, uh, in 1971, yes, I supported the unity of Pakistan, but supporting the unity of a sovereign nation is one thing, and getting involved in, in any criminal activities is quite another. I was not involved in any criminal activities of any nature in 71 or since. In fact, uh, I was not even a supporter of military action, and I resigned my political posts after the military crackdown. You've said that you are willing to face a fair trial to clear your name. Would you appear before the war crimes trial in Bangladesh? Well, not uh, simply because the tribunal in Bangladesh is a joke. It is a sham trial they are conducting. A lot of people in the international community is uh, quite critical of the process and la uh, the, the standards they are following and uh, investigation carried out uh, by the Economist Journal clearly uh, identified a number of corruptions as well as uh, collusion between the, prosecu the investigating team, prosecution team, judges and outside activists, which is appalling, as, as well as interference from the ministers and uh, they are attempt to try to influence the course of justice. This is a, just a kangaroo court, this is not a proper court, and no one will be willing to submit themselves to such a, a court of law. 
What contact, if any, have you had from the court itself? Have you been issued, for instance, with a list of the exact charges against Not you? Not at all. This is surprising and this is a travesty that uh, although I uh, have never concealed my name or identity, I lived an open and transparent life uh, for the last 40 years in Britain and I'm a member of uh, uh, the community, a respected member of the community and take part in a number of uh, welfare, charitable and other activities. So I am not hiding myself. Why they are not able to uh, present it to me, I don't understand. In terms of your background, in terms of the time, 1971, the War of Independence in Bangladesh, were you at any time a member of the al Bada Brigade? To remind you, this was a group of collaborators during the war that supported the efforts of the Pakistani army against uh, the efforts of Bangladesh to gain its independence? Absolutely not. I was never a part of al Bada or any other organization. As I said, I resigned from my political posts after the military crackdown, and I concentrated in my journalistic career since then. I was in my uh, job in on duty until the end, on up to 15th of uh, December 1979. So there was absolutely, as you are a journalist yourself, you will know that uh, for a staff reporter of a very busy daily newspaper, there's hardly any other time for, for him to get involved in any other activities. Well, a as a reporter, you must have known uh, and, and covered a good deal of the activities of al -Bada. What do you know, what do you recall of the activities of the al -Bada Brigade? Uh, it's alleged, for instance, that al -Bada operatives drew up hit lists, that they tortured and murdered pro-independence activists, including journalists and academics, with the aim of denuding or depriving an independent Bangladesh of, of its intellectuals. Well, I have not reported any such thing and uh, neither did anyone else because these activities happened at the very end on the uh, last two days of the uh, before liberation. And uh, there was a number of theories floating who was responsible for this. So there was hardly any report in uh, anywhere before the independence. Yes, after independence people uh, did concocted stories and other stories of all nature uh, in the newspapers and other media. Um, you, you, you're on record, and I, I, I think you've already mentioned it, that, that you did oppose politically the idea of an independent Bangladesh, that you did support the idea of a unified Pakistan. Can you explain to me why? What was, what was it about your politics and your political view? Well, my political view was uh, Pakistan is a sovereign uh, country. Uh, yes, there are faults, disparity, uh, injustices uh, between East and West wing of the country. But those things uh, could have been resolved politically through discussion and uh, dialogue rather than splitting the country into two. That was uh, our, our view and view of a lot of other people. but. Having a political view is one thing, and getting involved in any kind of criminality is quite another. And uh, I was never involved in any such thing, and I never advocated it. In fact, I was not uh, happy about the military crackdown and the atrocities they caused uh, in, the, uh, the, in the night of 25th of March uh, after military crackdown. So, so your view was sort of exclusively political or geopolitical, if you like. It, was it not religious at all? Because it's also claimed that you were a member of jamaat e a religious, conservative religious party. I am not a member of jamaat e but I was a member of the student wing at the time of my student life. Of jamaat e uh, Yes, but I resigned from that post after the military crackdown, as I said uh, earlier. My view was the country w was established in the name of Islam, although Islam was not uh, perhaps implemented, the justice and uh, fair play of Islam never seen in Pakistan. But there was a hope that at some stage maybe that uh, social justice will come in the country. Uh, so th there was a reason why ulama and uh, the religious scholars of all sorts supported the unity of the country. It, it is probably better to keep the unity of Ummah 
That was the idea. It may be right, it may be wrong, but that was a political decision. How do you feel now about the path that Bangladesh has taken since then? Well, the path is it's an independent country and everyone must accept the, uh, the reality. I do accept the reality. I, am, uh, I travel to Bangladesh uh, on and off. I assume, given recent developments, that you won't be traveling to Bangladesh well, anytime soon? No, uh, I mean, unless, uh, unless people are insane, they, they will not take that risk. Uh, because the way the country is run now, uh, international community is critical about uh, the whole go governance of the country. And th this is risky for anyone, uh, let alone me. If I may, we'll return to issues of the court and the trial in a minute. If I may, I'd like to go to documentary evidence produced and broadcast here in the United Kingdom some years back, considered at least abroad to be one of the seminal investigations into the events of 1971. Documentary evidence in which your former colleague and editor Atika Rahman on the Pobadesh newspaper that you worked on in 1971 says that you were able to produce exclusive scoops about al Badr because, he says, you had unique information about al Badr because, in fact, he says you sat on the Central Committee of al Badr. Well, first of all, you refer to a 18-year-old dramatized documentary, and well, these were actual interviews, of course, yeah, not that dramatized evidence, interviews. Those interviews, that evidence, was submitted to the Attorney General and the Scotland Yard War Crimes Tribunal by Channel Four, and uh, they have both investigated. War Crimes, uh, Scotland Yard War Crimes Unit wrote back to Channel 4, returning their evidence, saying that they have consulted the CPS and the FCO's Foreign and Commonwealth Office legal team, and the advice they received is not to, there is no need to proceed any further. And the copy of that letter, Scotland Yard War Crimes uh, Unit actually uh, copied to me as well, and here is the copy if you want. Uh, so that was the quality of the evidence you are referring to. And in fact, I have no intention of getting involved in specifics because the, my legal advice is uh, it may prejudice the, any future uh, legal process. So I will not get involved in any, any discussion on specific issues. F f fair enough. Uh, is, it, is it then your contention and the contention of your legal team that these interviews that are reproduced in this film by people who purport to be eyewitnesses, by people who purport to have seen you personally involved, for instance, in abduction squads, is simply false, fictitious? Well, you have seen the trial process in Bangladesh and the nature of eyewitnesses. Uh, there are a lot of stories floating uh, and in fact uh, proved that some of these eyewitnesses are quite uh, uh, opposite to the truth. I feel sorry for the victims, but I do not want to comment on their, their statements. But they are, there must be a number of reasons why they made such uh, statements. F fair enough. L let me ask you then, not about a specific accusation or statement about you, but rather about Feni, your hometown, three hours or so to the south of the capital, Dakar. Um, a professor at the college in Feni is quoted talking about the college campus at the time in those final few days of the war uh, that had become a, a death camp run by al Bada, in which he says the hair, the heads and the hands of many people were found after the war, a, a burial ground. This is a college that you were educated at yourself. Feni was your hometown. You travelled there or are said to have travelled there a lot during the war. What did you know, if anything, about what was going on at Feni College? Were you aware of anything going on at Feni, well, Feni College? No. I travelled to Feni during the whole nine months of war only twice for a very short period of time. and. Uh, I mean, they cannot blame me to be in Dhaka, carrying out those activities in Dhaka as well as in Feni. 
<laughs> this, is, this was physically impossible for a person. I was in Dhaka and they, it is well evidenced. So f I cannot talk about Feni. But uh, if there were some evidence, killing was from all sides. Uh, in fact, there are do well documented uh, video footage available of uh, lynching by the so called Mukti Bahini after the uh, independence. And uh, it was uh, shown throughout the world. The other one is all uh, supposition and conjecture and media publicity. There is no clear evidence of those uh, available anywhere. May, may I ask why you left Bangladesh when you did, within a year, or just over a year it was, after the end of the war? Why did you leave Bangladesh? No, I, I actually le left Bangladesh not after a year, I almost immediately after a few weeks. Uh, because of the publicity and propaganda started and my family thought that it would be risky for me, no matter wh how clear I was, the, uh, the madness that was uh, going on in the streets of Bangladesh, which was well evidenced in international media, it is risky for anyone uh, with such bad publicity to stay there. And why do you think such bad publicity was directed at you? What, what was yeah. it about you that singled you out for such scrutiny? Well, like now, there was this political uh, disagreement and uh, hostility even then. And there are a number of other reasons, professional and elsewhere. I do not want to get involved in that because the, some of the players are not even alive now. So talking about them is not really fair. But give me a sense without necessarily going into the detail of what it was about a young journalist who did nothing more than f follow his profession and report conscientiously and objectively about the events of a war that was going on around him. What, what was it that marked you out for particular attention? It, it, it is, uh, well, to make it very short, it is political and professional hostility and nothing more than that. Jealousy? Envy? It could be, uh, but I, I, it's not for me to say. Once uh, all things are clear, people will understand and they will judge that it is probably that. Were you considered a threat? I was not considered as a threat, but uh, some people didn't like uh, the flair and the, uh, the, the uh, probably strength journalistic skills uh, I was demonstrating in such a young age. In terms of the court, in terms of the tribunal, it's been ongoing now since 2010. Uh, a number of former Jamaat-e Islami uh, leaders have been on trial, a number indeed have been given the death sentence. Um, the court itself uh, has had its integrity called into question by a number of international actors. Do you believe that there should be some sort of an international investigation into the workings of this, this trial in Bangladesh? There must be. I mean, this is a travesty of justice that uh, is being allowed. Uh, as I said, that uh, witnesses are abducted from the gates of the tribunal and nothing uh, is done about it. People are giving clearly uh, false evidence and it is proved time and again, nothing is done. The ministers and government, members of the government are interfering according to the chief judge of the court that uh, in his own words in Bengali that the government has gone mad and they are insisting on a verdict as quickly as possible. What, if this is not political interference, what is? And how uh, anyone can subject people's life, uh, lives un under uh, such a tribunal? This is corrupt to the core, and uh, it's rotten to the core, rather. And uh, th this should be stopped immediately. If the uh, people wants uh, to see justice, then it should be under UN supervision in the international arena, not, not under this corrupt regime. All of which said, you now find yourself in the eye of this storm. Um, 
they would presumably like very much to see you back in Bangladesh to face these charges. Do you believe that there is a chance that you might be extradited? Do you know whether any request has been made for extradition? No, not that I know of, but uh, I hear that there is there are government mi ministers doing and flowing, lobbying uh, uh, British authorities. Apart from that, there was no official request. At least the British authorities never informed me of any official request. Well, I wanted to ask you whether you've had any contact with the authorities. You, uh, you hold dual British and Bangladeshi citizenship. You continue to play a prominent role, though you're clearly humble about that yourself, in the British Muslim community. You're a trustee of the charity Muslim Aid. You're a director of Muslim spiritual care provision in Britain's National Health Service. I would say that qualifies you as a fairly prominent member of society here. Have you had any contact at all from the British authorities following the filing of these charges? Has anybody sought to question you no, at all? Not at all. But uh, for, for your information, I think it should be fair to uh, inform your viewers that I have never tried to hide my name or identity after arriving in this country. And I have uh, inform the British authorities about these stories floating about against me in Bangladeshi media immediately after arrival in 1975 through my MP at the time, Arthur W. J. Lewis of Newham. And uh, was, um, I was interviewed by the Home Office extensively on this matter. Uh, after that, they have further invest investigated in Pakistan and Bangladesh and uh, the then Home Minister Alex Lyon wrote to my MP saying that there is no cause for concern and I can continue to live here. The charges against you, whatever one makes of them, are serious indeed. Involvement potentially in the abduction and killings of 18 people. Um, the head of the police service in Bangladesh has said he believes there are many more but they could only find evidence of 18. I know that you dispute these charges. Uh, I know that you've said that you would like to clear your name but you won't do that in Bangladesh. What are you prepared to do to clear your name? What would you like to be able to do to clear your name? I will try to do everything in my power to tell my story and in fact uh, yeah, one day people will understand uh, those people who are actually impartial, they do understand even now. And as I said, some of the uh, seniors of my newspaper, the man who accused me was of my same level. He was a co-staff reporter. Atika Rahman. Atika Rahman. But the, my seniors, uh, my editors never uh, for a moment uh, suspected my integrity and my honesty. Atika Rahman says that he asked you, you asked him for his exact address on the night or a few nights before these disappearances that. that you gave a false address which I later appeared next that. to his name on an al Bada hit list. This is nonsense in well, your view? All of it untrue. There is absolutely no substance in it. And if I were to give you this invitation right now to sum up your side of the story, your effort to clear your name, what, 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 what would that be? My side of the story is, uh, yes, I was a supporter of the unity of the country, but I was never involved in any criminal activities. In fact, I did not support the military action, military crackdown, and I was critical. Those who were living near me, in fact, there are sworn affidavit from my roommate at the time, an engineer and others, they, they are still alive. And they knew that I was criticizing the Pakistani authorities for the atrocities every day in our personal discussions. So uh, people are aware, some, of, some people have said, why you? You opposed it and now they, they are blaming you. So that is the question. My story is I was a supporter of unity of the country, but I love Bangladesh and I want Bangladesh to prosper and flourish and I'll do everything in my power uh, to help that process in future. And, and yet you've made a life here in Britain. Do you feel safe in Britain? Do you feel safe uh, away from the arms of justice in Bangladesh? Well, arms of, I am not uh, afraid of arms of justice if it is a proper justice. And I am quite prepared to present myself to British system of justice because I know that they are uh, um, fair and 
uh, honest, unlike Bangladesh. Chowdhury, Mohinuddin, thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you.